New every morning is your love, great God of light, and all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and to devote every day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. My name is Kevin Johnson. I serve as pastor here at Macedonia United Methodist Church. It is a joy to welcome you to worship on this third Sunday of Easter. I'm grateful for the bells ringing us off this morning and for the joy that it is to gather together. If you're a guest with us today, I invite you to fill out the connect card that you might find right in the pew back in front of you. You're welcome to fill that out. You can drop it in the offering plate when we come forward later for communion or to hand it to an usher or myself on the way out of the door today. You can also text hello to the number you'll see in your bulletin. And if you're worshiping with us online, you can find that bulletin in the description below on both the YouTube channel uh, or, or on the Facebook post. I invite you to stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship today. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. Shine your light upon us today, O God. We know that when Jesus appears, we will be like him. You reveal yourself to us anew. We love because God first loved us. Help us practice love. Rejoice, ye pure in heart, is our opening hymn. Let's sing together.
Our opening prayer can be found on the top of page two of your bulletin. I invite you to pray with me. God, who is love, you showed us your love by sending Jesus to live among us, to walk with us, to die for us, and to be raised in us. Give us the grace and courage to reflect your self-giving love in every part of our lives. Through Jesus, the one who lives in us, by the power of his spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I invite those who are coming to join the life of our church to come forward and meet me up front. Friends, it's always a joy to welcome new folks into Life Our Church. Y'all can just stand right there and face them so they can see your beautiful faces. We have with us today Karen and Eric Packard and Lynn Pierce and Teresa Hunt, uh, all coming to join the life of our church together. Uh, they've been worshiping with us for various times. Uh, some of them even in Lynn were members a long way back and are co coming back to join the life of our church now in this stage of life. So it's wonderful um, to have them all with us. Uh, I'm just going to ask a few questions. You'll find pages 38 and 39, and, um, and, and it'll give you, the congregation, a chance to respond to them as well. So first I ask y'all, as members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. And as members of this congregation here at Macedonia, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your hope to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And if you'll respond together. We give thanks for all that God has already given you. And we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Friends, the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Okay, Lynn. Yes, good to see you. So glad you're here. So glad you all are part of us. Thank you. Eric, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Teresa. God bless you all. Friends, would you welcome these folks into the life of our church? It's so good to have them. I invite you to make sure that you uh, introduce yourselves to them. I know that many of them have made themselves very available. All of them have uh, in many ways, but you might not know all four of them up here. So I invite you to introduce yourselves to them uh, following worship or, or to extend passing the peace a little bit today to do that. Y'all have a seat. Thank you. Our Psalter lesson this morning comes from the fourth Psalm. I'd invite you to read responsively. Answer me when I cry out, my righteous God, set me free from my troubles. Have mercy on me. Listen to my prayer. How long, you people, will my retribution be insulted? How long will you continue to love what is worthless and go after lies? Know this, the Lord takes personal care of the faithful. The Lord will hear me when I cry out to him. So don't be afraid and don't sin. Think hard about it in your bed and weep over it. Bring righteous offerings and trust the Lord. Many people say we can't find goodness anywhere. 
The light of your face has left us, Lord, but you have filled my heart with more joy than when their wheat and wine are everywhere. I will lie down and fall asleep in peace because you alone, Lord, let me live in safety. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing. seated. You may, be, you may be wondering today, did Miles' voice change or something like that? And no, the answer is no, we got a new microphone. And so it works. Um, and so you might say, oh my goodness, I could hear him today. And um, that was my reaction as well. Uh, so what a joy. He is not that young. Uh, he <laughs> 1 John chapter 3 uh, is our text today. We're continuing this series called Reflecting Jesus as we, as we go through the book of 1 John. Um, and here's some of these verses that might be familiar, but we may not have read them through before. Um, and I would surely wonder if you've heard five or six straight weeks preaching of 1 John in your life. Uh, the answer is probably not, but let's do it together uh, this week. And I, I'm excited for what God will speak to us this morning. For see what kind of love the Father has given to us, so that we should be called God's children, and that is what we are. Because the world didn't recognize him, it doesn't recognize us. Dear friends, now we are God's children, and it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion, and sin is rebellion. You know that when he appeared to take away sins, and there is, there is, you know that he appeared to take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Every person who remains in relationship to him does not sin. Any person who sins has not seen him or known him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The person who practices righteousness is righteous in the same way that Jesus is righteous. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I almost got into a fight on Wednesday night with the umpire 
of my girls' softball game. It was opening night of the Rockies' seven-game season in mini softball, yours truly, after signing up to be the assistant coach, knowing my schedule would not allow me to be at all the games, of course was signed up by the city to be the head coach because that's how these things work. And um, my oldest is up to bat and, and it's coach pitch, which puts undue stress upon the head coach while pitching in a softball game. And so I'm up there pitching and she hits a ground ball. They all hit ground balls at this age, but it's the, the main key is that it, the ball is hit, okay? And so we're celebratory about that, and she hits it, and she bolts up the line, goes at a good clip, and, I, and I'm like, she's surely safe, and the third baseman makes a throw over to first. The ball lands there after she's been past first base for three steps, and the umpire calls her out. Aside, this umpire cannot see at all, okay? <laughs> he is notoriously terrible. And yeah, and so I immediately began the, are you kidding me? And then I stopped with every pastoral stop in my body because my wife was the first base coach at the time and um, <laughs> she probably had more words for Mr umpire than I did and um and she but she was telling her just go back to the dugout it's you were safe it's okay and then I, I remembered I had signed all these documents that said the type of sportsmanship that I would offer which I was trying to renege in my head at that moment so that I could get in a fight with this umpire because here's the deal an umpire can make a bad call everything like that but you don't mess with my kid she was safe okay <laughs> And everyone knew. I mean, the other, the other team was like, oh, no, she, she was safe. Like, I mean, everyone, right? You don't mess with my kid. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called God's children. And that is what we are, John says. That is what we are. We are God's children. Children, John is wanting to emphasize with us more than anything else in this entire text that we are the children of God, that you are a child of God, and that requires some mama bear, papa bear energy <laughs> once in a while that comes across. I don't want to tell you the thoughts I had about that umpire during that game, right? That is what we are, John says. As I told you, we're going to connect this back to John's gospel all of the time. And in the prologue to the gospel of John in chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, you'll recognize that this is probably one of the pithiest and most full statements in all of Scripture in those first 18 verses. John 1, 12, it says this, But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. John introduces this idea, right, that we are born from God. He will get into it later when he talks with, when Jesus talks with Nicodemus and talks to him about being born again or born a second time or born from above. And Nicodemus is confused. How can I be born a second time? How does this really work, right? And Jesus is talking about something else entirely. And Nicodemus doesn't quite get it. Well, in the same way, I mean, you're a child of whoever you're a child of, right? And yet, God is saying, no, you're, you're my child first, God's own. This is what I love so much about when we bring children forward for baptism. And I was telling a Sunday school class last week, I, I, y'all, I grew up Baptist. The thing that kept me the most from being United Methodist was baptizing a baby, okay? It was like a six-year process. It was an argument inside of Denny's in Henderson, North Carolina with my wife about baptism that went very long. Um, but anyway, that's a whole nother question for another time, and I'll share that with you if you are, really need some sleeping uh, remedy that night. But, but um but when we bring a child forward for baptism, y'all, that baby, that baby didn't pray a prayer of salvation yet. They, they, they don't know to, right? Sometimes they sleep through the whole ordeal. 
Sometimes they cry through this, the whole ordeal. If you're lucky and then you get the right, the right window of time, they're kind of cute during it, right? And so, so, so all that happens. But what we are saying in that moment of baptism, right, is that you are God's child. You are. You can't do a darn thing about it. God has marked you and claimed you as his own, so we're going to pour this water on you because you're experiencing God's grace even though you don't know it yet. It confirms our identity as God's child. Not only that, but being someone's child gives us a sense of belonging. We become, we become part of that family, right? So God claims us as God's children. We become part of God's family, and we recognize that there is a complete difficulty that happens when we feel like we don't belong in a family, right? When we feel like we struggle to belong. Y'all know the pain of family estrangements that happen. They're all too common. And, and, and the pain that happens in that lack of belonging for someone. The isolation that can happen when we know that there is this primary unit that we're supposed to belong to and we don't quite fit it. Whether on our end or whether on the other people's end in it. And it causes great pain. But what Jesus is saying in calling us God's children, right, is that we indeed have an identity as God's own and we belong to God's family. Friends, this illustration of being God's children is not just an illustration. It's not just a metaphor that John is giving. It is a whole lot more than that. It is a reality about who we are, our identity, and whose we are, our belonging. Verse 2, he says, Dear friends, now we are God's children. And it hasn't yet been reve revealed what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. God's children, God's children, he's saying, are the spitting image of Jesus. All right? It's almost taking us back to Genesis 2 when God gets on the ground, right? And God is forming Adam. Adam's name literally means from the dirt, okay? That's what Adam means in Hebrew, okay? Adama is from the earth, right? So, so, so he's, he's there. There he is. God's forming it. He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living being, right? Notices that it's not good for the man to be alone. What does he do? Takes a rib out of the man, right? And forms a woman out of, out of that, right? And calls her Eve. The spit and image of God. And it's not just that we look like we are in God's image. It's not just like that, well, Jesus was a man. So he kind of looked like he's, so God has these human characteristics or something like that. It's not even about that. It's actually about the, the manner even more of how God acts. And I think that's what Jesus is, what John is referring to in this text. My oldest child, if any of y'all know how she acts and behaves, she acts a lot like I did at her age. And in fact, especially when she was younger, when she was four and five and going around and she knew everyone's name at the church and everywhere else, like this extreme extroversion and stuff. Uh, when my parents would they'd be like, Good Lord, she acts just like you did when you were that age. She didn't know me when I was three or four, right? She didn't have that model or anything like that. And in fact, I strongly doubt that she just picked it up from me. Some of it's not just, not just taught. It was just caught in who she was, right? There's a manner that starts to take place. Now, thank God she's not just like me. It's a good thing. But, but, but there is some manner that gets taken in the spit and image this likeness of a child. Now we are God's children, the text is saying. And we are made in God's image and likeness. It confirms who we are. But then John continues in this passage into a part that may be a little bit more difficult for us to grasp. He says, every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion, and sin is rebellion. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Every person who remains in relationship to him does not sin. Any person who sins has not seen him or known him. And when I hear that last verse, I, I start to question it. And you, and you might too, especially if you dig into it. Verse 6 of that says, Every person who remains in relationship to him 
does not sin. The logic of these verses is this. First, sin is rebellion against God, right? That's a pretty good definition of sin, a rebellion against God. So second, Jesus doesn't have any sin in him, which you might say, duh, got it. And then the third one is, if you're in Jesus, then you don't sin, which then we say, oh, shoot, right? Because, you see, we're going to come to a time where we confess our sin up here, and we all are going to talk about and confess how we have sinned. Like, most of us probably have sinned this morning. I know I have, right? So, so, so what is it, John? What are you talking about, right? He says, every person who remains in relationship with him does not sin. Any person who sins has not seen him or known him. Later in verse 9 that we didn't read, he says, those born from God don't practice sin because God's DNA remains in them. They can't sin because they are born from God, which then starts most of us question, well, am I even born from God? I mean, shoot, if I just said this morning, maybe not. And so we start asking these questions, what do we do with this? But John said just last week, when we read in, verse one, in chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And 2.2, 2, he said, Jesus is God's way of dealing with our sins, right? Before that, but if we do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I think that in John's writing, and we don't know who John exactly is writing to and who he's writing against in this letter that we don't have the addressee for, it seems like there was this group saying, hey, we don't sin, we never sin, we don't mess up, you see, because we, we, we are in Christ, we are truly the chosen ones, and the problem is that, that group was blatantly sinning and ignoring the ways of Christ. And I think that's what's at stake here is that John is saying, well, if you really were in the ways of Christ, then you wouldn't be sinning like you are. You wouldn't be choosing that. Because yet we have to reconcile chapter 3, verse 6 and 9 versus what John has just said about having forgiveness of sins and when we do sin, that we are forgiven. And I think one key word as I was reading this passage this week that comes to me is this. We find it in both verse 4 and verse 7. In verse 4, he says, every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion, and sin is rebellion. In verse 7, he says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The person who practices righteousness is righteous in the same way that Jesus is righteous. I like the way this common English translation translates this passage when it talks about practicing sin and practicing righteousness. And John offers these as two alternatives. Now, I was thinking about practice this week, and, and many of us were drawn to basketball over the last couple of weeks, right? And, and although locally the, the story for us was, was the Wolfpack and, and both teams making it to the Final Four and everything, the national story was about one player, right? The national story was about Caitlin Clark, right? And, and, and her, like, utter domination. And if you watched... If, if you watch that girl shoot, holy cow, right? And it's unbelievable. And she can pull up from 40 feet out. And, and so what I did, I, I looked up what her practice routine was this week. And I found many, many countless YouTube videos that you could go down a long rabbit hole of, which I did not. But I did watch one. And, and Caitlin shoots 300 shots per day. And she logs exactly how many she makes because she first takes 103 pointers in real game time right, with someone rebounding for her. Then she takes 100 mid-range shots. Then she takes 100 free throws. And her goal is to make 230 of, out of all of those shots every time. Now, you start to add up what happens when you do that 300 times a day, every day of the off-season, and what that looks like. And the point of it all, right, is that for Caitlin, when she pulls up from that 40-footer or whatever, she's taken that shot a kajillion times. That's a technical word, right? And so she takes that shot a kajillion times. And the fact is, is that she is hoping that there is a muscle memory in her body that just feels what that is to drain that shot and to put it in. Now, uh, I like Caitlin Clark. No, just kidding. Um, so, but I was, I, I was thinking about practice in my own life this week. And, and this year, I had the privilege or the great responsibility and fear of being, uh, of being the accompanist for the Douglas Elementary School Chorus for fourth and fifth grade, okay? Now, y'all know I'm musical, but I'm not a pianist, or at least I'm not anymore, okay? Like, I like to sit and play, but 
but to accompany a choir was a whole thing entirely. And, and, and the, Christmas, the Christmas deal that we did when I had to accompany two songs wasn't too bad. We started at the senior citizen's home, okay? So I figured that a lot of them couldn't hear half the things I was playing, so it was okay, right? But the fact is, is that we did it at the elementary school, very forgiving audience. But this spring, we got up there, and we had to play. We, they, they were singing at Maymandy Hall for this Raleigh area chorus combined festival, and, and, and yours truly is up there in a suit for the first couple songs playing, and... Uh, I was so intimidated, I've not, and I've not had to practice like I had to practice ever in my life for this. Because y'all, my fingers could not do it like they could when I was 10 or 11 years old and practicing every day because someone was making me. This time I was practicing every day because I was terrified, okay? So, so the practice is pouring in everything like that, and, and, and my fingers would not memorize the licks that they needed to do. But yet, I can go back and play something that I learned when I was 10 years old, a 50-note run from a Kulau Sonatina, like I just learned it yesterday. And there's something that happens with practice in our brains that, that put those things into my muscle memory. I can literally sit down and play that run today. Friends, my, my question is, what kind of habits, what kind of habits are you practicing, right? It's easy to think about it in terms of sports or in terms of music. But I think that we don't automatically respond in our lives to people with unselfishness or with kindness. That's not like our immediate response as people. So it takes practice. And the question about this becomes about how are you living with intentionality? How are you living with intentionality? That's what that word practice implies, right? That I'm going to go out and intentionally live with purpose this day as God's child, are you living like it? Are you practicing righteousness, as John talks about? I think a lot of us would say, well, sort of. I mean, you know, I'm like, try to be nice and stuff. But like, John is clearly talking about something more than that. He's saying, like, today, are you going to go out and do the equivalent of shooting 300 jumpers? Like, are you going to do it? in your spiritual life? Are you going to practice and hone righteousness? And in John's world and in John's way of looking at the world, the alternative is this. If you're not, you're probably practicing sin. That's what he would say. Now, most of us probably aren't intentionally going out and practicing sin. But I think John's perspective is such that, like, if we're not living with that intention of being the children of God, then the alternative is pretty much that we're practicing rebellion against God. Now, I want you to hear this. These verses and this way of looking at it in John does not mean that you are supposed to just behave perfectly and that that is all that life is about is behave, behave, behave. Make sure you live a flawless life. Life That is not what John is expressing in this text. What I think it is, is this. You are a child of God. So live as one. Freely live as one. I had a professor at my college. And his name was Keith Drury. And I went to Indiana Wesleyan University. It's a Wesleyan college, part of the holiness movement that descends from the Methodist movement. And, um, and I didn't know anything about Wesleyans or anything when I went to school, but Coach Jury was my teacher in Christian leadership and some preaching courses. And, um, and we had a lot of wonderful discussions together, and he taught me a great deal, and he died earlier this week. And I've been thinking about him reconnecting with some other classmates this week. And, and Coach had something I would describe as like this twinkle in his eye when he would teach. And it was this magical kind of twinkle. I don't know how to describe it to you other than that. Like, like Disney-ish, right? And so, so like it would, it would literally, he, his smile would light up when he was about to say something that was extremely poignant and a little bit mischievous, right? Just this little bit 
mischievous. And coach would give these grand pieces of advice. And there's, there's a few things I learned from him. He had these pithy sayings that he would say. And one of them was this. He said, I'd rather have a good preacher for 50 years than a great preacher for five years. And I, and, I, and I think about that often. I've quoted it to many people as I've thought about burnout and the way, that, and, and, and the way often that, that we live. And Coach wrote a lot about holiness because that was tr- the tradition he was in. He, was, he wrote a ton of books, um, especially for the Wesleyan Church. And I think about him because for him, holiness was not a chore. Holiness was not some set of legalistic rules to be followed. Rather, it was the freedom of living as a child of God. Coach was this extremely joyful person. He would lead trips. I mean, this guy hiked all of the Appalachian Trail at some point. He biked all through everywhere. Uh, I mean, just amazing guy and who loved mentoring students along the way. And for him, a life of following Jesus, a life of holiness, was not some joyless existence, some like legalistic nightmare. Rather, it was this wonderful freedom of being God's child and living with this intentionality of practicing righteousness. Friends, you are God's child. You are, right? That's what John tells us. That is what you are. You belong in God's family as God's child. You can be secure in that belonging. And you have a purpose as God's child. So practice it. Let us pray. Holy God, I pray that you would help us to recognize our identity in you as your children. I admit that sometimes I do not live like that is my first identity. Lord, I admit that sometimes I don't feel that sense of belonging in your family. I wonder sometimes how I fit. If I've estranged myself, if I'm estranged from you. And Lord, sometimes I wonder how am I doing at practicing? Am I practicing for your kingdom ways? Or am I practicing actually ways that work against what you're trying to do in the world? God, I pray that we would be secure in that identity in you, that we are your children. That we'd be secure that we belong to you, that we would find that that constant sense of comfort and grounding. And Lord, that we would find our purpose in you. That as your children, we would practice righteousness so that we might grow deeper and deeper into our relationship with you as our parent and so that we might invite others into your family. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to receive God's grace at the table, I'd invite you to stand as you're able and join me in confessing what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. What a great world it would be, God, our friend, if we all kept our lives grafted in Christ Jesus, the true vine, and like good branches produced the bountiful fruits of the Spirit. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be if we cared for the sick and the handicapped, the diseased and the mentally ill, like Jesus did. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be if we sought the lost and bewildered people and restored their dignity and hope, as Jesus did. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be if we opened our arms and hearts to misfits and outcasts and our arms to the untouchable, as Jesus did. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be if we practiced forgiving our enemies and doing good to those who spitefully abuse us, like Jesus did. God, we pray for your earthly family that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be if we let others borrow what we have and gave gifts without looking for reward, as Jesus did. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be if we created a new community out of desperate types of people, just as Jesus did with his disciples. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. What a great world it would be if we prepared to carry our own crosses with the courage and faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray for your earthly family, that they may know the fullness of your love. Loving God, bind us close to your lovely Christ. Let his spirit flow within us, healing our defects and enabling us to produce the fruits of love, both in and out of season, to the glory of your name. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Friends, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer one another signs of peace, reconciliation, and love.
Friends, I invite you to remain standing, and uh, as, as we, as you're able, as we prepare for the great Thanksgiving, I'll share with you uh, that Macedonia 101 is coming up on April 28th at 3 o'clock. You're invited to, uh, to come and learn more about the life of our church. Uh, if you're if, if you're thinking about what it might mean to be a member here, I invite you to come and join that day. Just be able to ask your questions and, and, and join with me. Or if you have others you know of um, who might be thinking that way too or, or who you'd li like to invite, I invite you to bring them and, and, and have them come with you uh, that afternoon from 3 to 4.30. And now let us, uh, let us join together in the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God. You delivered us and brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made covenant with us by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a similar way, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, on those worshiping with us online, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Now, with the confidence of God's children, we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the bread which you break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. You may be seated. Friends, we'll receive today by intinction. It means you'll receive a piece of the bread as the usher leads you forward. And then you're invited to take that and dip it into the cup. All are welcome at the United Methodist Church at our table. There is uh, no requirement of membership and children are welcome as well. If you need gluten-free elements, those are available as well as if you can't make it forward, we're happy to come to you uh, after those who have made it forward have come. Now come taste and see that the Lord is good.
far and near to find as all are fed the new community of love in Christ communion bread in Christ communion bread breaks bread and bids a share each proud division ends the love that made us makes us one and strangers now are friends and strangers now are friends always near is in such friendship better known we see and praise him here we see and praise him
his life laid down for me. far and near to find as all are fed the new community of love in Christ's communion bread in Christ's communion bread As Christ breaks bread and bids a share, each proud division ends. The love that made us makes us one, and strangers now are friends. And strangers now are friends. Friends, when we come to this table, we remember our identity as children of God. And when we remember that identity, that we are children of God, we are also reminded that we are reconstituted into a new family, that then we, all of us, are brothers and sisters with one another, which is really annoying that God does that. Because then that means that, you know, we're going to squabble like siblings do from time to time. And it means that ultimately we are deeply connected to one another. Not just, the, not just the people that we naturally get along with and like, but all of them. Both in the local body of the church and then also with all the other Christians that God has called. Even the ones who think differently about some things that I don't agree with them on, that God has called us into communion with one another, even ones who maybe have left us to gone to somewhere else. God has called us into communion with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And darn if that's not just annoying that he does that. But he does. And that's where this isn't just a metaphor that we get to choose when we want to live in it or not. But instead, we are God's children. We are connected as part of God's family, even as our mission says that we work together to connect isolated people with God's family. And that then we are siblings with one another. That we are brothers and sisters who are going to have each other's back through thick and thin and that we're gonna get through squabbles and annoyances with each other 
for the good, for the good of our Heavenly Father. Friends, that's a different outlook maybe than the world's outlook of community with each other today. I would encourage you to I would encourage you with that to say that when we come here, did you know that you dip that bread into a cup with someone who's going to vote differently from you in November? I guarantee it. You did. You definitely did. Right? And our primary identity is children of God. Children of God. And friends, let us remember that in all seasons. All seasons. I'm not trying to preempt what's coming in six months from now because Lord knows we're going to have enough of that mess. But friends, our identity, this is not, we're not playing pretend. It's not just a cute little metaphor that we are God's children and that we are family. This is reality. This, this, that's why we touch it. <laughs> like First John said, it's what we have heard, what we have seen, what our hands have touched. And what we do is we remind each other of that reality and God reminds us in holy and real ways. Friends, that's the significance of what we do. That's the significance of what it could mean for our world today. So I hope that as we remember our identity as God's children, our belonging as part of God's family and that purpose that we have to practice, to practice righteousness, that we'd remember that today. I invite you to join me in this prayer following communion. Bottom of page six. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I just stand as you are able as we sing together, Blessed Assurance. Friends, receive this blessing. 
Glory to God, who by his power at work within you is able to do abundantly far more than you could ever ask or imagine. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and for all generations, forever and always. Amen. Amen.